Good morning and welcome to New Beginnings House of Worship as we come this day to celebrate a live and a living God. And we ask you to come in with a joyous spirit as we are in celebration of Black History Month. Uh, that we have many things that God has blessed us with and we should celebrate and, and give recognition and praise to God. For. So at this moment, we're going to go in and ask Sister Rosalind Turner if she could come as she does with our morning welcome. Good morning. Thank you once again for joining us here at New Beginnings House of Worship. We want to thank you for taking out a little time of your day just to share with us and to learn what thus says the Lord. Remember to have a good week this week, celebrating Valentine's Day tomorrow and celebrating the blessings that God has um, given us for uh, people to love on. I want to wish some happy birthdays for my two um, grandkids from yesterday. We have little Dylan and we have Khalees who celebrated birthdays yesterday. Dylan turned 13. He's a, now a teenager and Khalees turned 12. And then a very special happy birthday to my mom. She'll be celebrating her 82nd birthday on Wednesday. So we want to thank God for all the many blessings that he's pouring upon her and to see the great age of 82 and she's still spunky and we praise God for that. Now we're going to have our black history moment from Rachel Turnip Seed and we're going to learn something good. Hi, good morning to you all and God bless you. Today I'm going to talk about a black history moment. Uh, this is dealing with uh, Central Park in New York City, but it was before. So, nearly 200 years ago, Central Park's landscape near the West 85th Street entrance was home to Seneca Village, a community predominantly free, Afri a community of predominantly free African American property owners. By 1855, the village consisted of approximately 225 residents made up of roughly two-thirds African Americans, one-third Irish immigrants, and a small number of individuals of German descent. Seneca Village allowed residents to live away for, from the more built-up sections of downtown Manhattan and escape the unhealthy conditions and the racial discrimination they faced there. Seneca Village began in 1825 when landowners in the area, John and Elizabeth Whitehead, subdivided their land and sold it as 200 lots. Andrew Williams, a 25-year-old African-American shoe shiner, bought the first three lots for $125. Epiphany Davis, a store clerk, bought 12 lots of $578, and the AME Zion Church purchased another six lots. From there, a community was born from 1825 to 1832. The Whiteheads sold about half of their land parcels to the other African Americans. By the early 1830s, there were approximately 10 homes in the village. There is some evidence that presidents had gardens and raised livestock in Seneca Village. A nearby spring known as Tanner Spring provided a water source, and the nearby Hudson River was likely a source of fishing for the community. By the mid-1850s, uh, I'm sorry, Seneca Village compromised 50 homes and three churches, as well as burial grounds and the school for African American students. For African Americans, Seneca Village offered the opportunity to live in an independent community without discrimination and severe limita limitation of their lives. Compared to other African, African Americans living in New York, residents of Seneca Village seemed to have been more stable and prosperous by 1855. Approximately half of them owned their homes, their own homes. With property ownership came other rights and not commonly held by African Americans in the city namely the right to vote. In 1821, New York State required African-American men to own at least $250 in property and hold residency for at least three years to be able to vote. Of the black New Yorkers eligible to vote in 1845, 10 lived in Seneca Village. During the early 1850s, the city began planning for a large municipal park. In 1853, the New York State legislator enacted a law that set aside 775 acres of land in Manhattan to create the country's first major landscape park. The city acquired the land through eminent domain, the law that allows the government to take private 
a land for public use with compensation paid to the landowner. There were roughly 1,600 inhabitants displaced throughout the area. Although landowners were compensated, many argued that their land was undervalued. Ultimately, all residents had to leave by the end of 1850. There has been ongoing work to learn uh, more about residents in the lives of Seneca Village um, right now. Um, if you want to know more about this story, go to centralparknewyork.org. There's links to other um, sites to read about this story, and it still is on. Thank you, and y'all have a blessed day. We want to thank you, Rachelle, for sharing us that intriguing history um, of our people in that, with that Black History Moment. Remember, it's important to share that information so that our children can learn how to further build things from all the positive things that our people has done. Thank you, and have a blessed week. Amen. Thank you for that welcome and that wonderful Black History Moment. It is very important that we learn these things and that we share this information about the uh, accomplishments of African Americans in this country. That it's good to know that they are still doing some research on this Seneca village that's a part of the park system. But this morning we want you to get your word out and uh, get ready for a message from, that God has delivered to us all. And we want you to get your books out, your Bibles out, and go to Luke chapter 16. We're going to be reading from verses 19 to 31. Luke 16, verses 19 through 31. I'll be reading from the King James Version. And so if you have your Bibles, if not, you can pay attention to the screen and we have the scripture verses ready for you. And the word says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and in hell, <clears throat> excuse me, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and sees Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham says unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, And if they hear not Moses and <clears throat> excuse me, and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Amen. This is the reading of the word this morning for our scriptural message. And so as a thought today, I'd just like to leave with you this thought the pitfalls of a selfish life. The pitfalls of a selfish life. And so, as is customary for me, I'd like to give you a biblical thought, a biblical truth to go with this message. 
and that is that honest self-examination will give you the right perspective in life. An honest self-examination will give you the right perspective in life. And we all need a good perspective. We all need to have some sort of self-examination, honest self-examination. And that's what will give you the right perspective in life. And I, I'm reminded of scripture in 2 Chronicles 13, verse 5. It says, examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except ye be reprobates. And so this scripture verse tells us to examine ourselves. And that's very important that we make some self-examination, an honest self-examination. Tell yourself the truth about yourself. He says to examine yourselves, whether ye be in the faith or not whether you really truly believe, whether you have really truly made Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. And then he tells us to prove your own selves or to test yourself. And you have to test yourself and see, well, am, am I doing the things that I'm supposed to be doing? Look at your life. Do you have the right perspective on life? Are you seeing things properly? Are you doing things according to God's word? And when you test yourself to prove your own self, scripture also tells us to make your calling and election sure. He says, know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you. You should know whether you really have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you know that he's in you, except if you are a reprobate or if you've been disqualified. If you do not have the Holy Spirit dwelling in you, you know that you're not uh, one who has accepted the faith or accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So the scripture tells us to examine ourselves. And that's the biblical truth I want you to uh, have from this message today. And that we have to recognize in ourselves, honestly, whether we are truly holding the faith. We have to maintain the right perspective in order to have everything working out for us in life. We have to have that right perspective on everything in our life. We can have this, this compartmentalized thing where we live in a silo over here for church and another silo over here for going to uh, the parties and another silo for, for living uh, our life on, on our jobs and in our communities. We have to have honest self-examination so that we can have the right perspective on life. You know, the world would try to tell us that you, you have to, uh, that everybody should be living a wealthy life. Everybody should be wealthy. Uh, if you're not, then something's wrong. And guess what? If something's wrong, then you need to do whatever you have to do. You have to do everything and anything in order for you to get yours. That's what the world will tell you. you you're not... If you don't feel that you're successful and you you don't have the wealth like the, like everybody else, you don't have the nice fine car and the nice fine home and, and all of these other things that go along with it, uh, then you need to do something to make sure that you get yours. And the world will tell you you can do anything and everything to get what you want. And, and that's the problem. That's where we end up living a selfish life. Because we don't care about other people. We don't care about other situations that's going on. It's all about me getting mine. And I want all eyes on me. And so when we think about this term selfish, how do you know whether you're really being selfish? And we know, uh, many of us know and understand that this word selfish, meaning that you're self-centered and everything is about you. You focus on yourself. And so well, here's one way that you will know whether you're selfish or not. And based on this text that we're going to deal with today, uh, how do you know whether you really are that selfish or that you're that self-centered person? Well, when everyone, uh, excuse me, whenever you can't see the need that someone else has who is right in front of you, then you know that you're selfish. If you can't see the need that someone has, that's right in front of you, that comes before you every day, that, that, that lives right next door to you and you see them every day, and that, or that lives in your community and you pass by that house every day and you know they have a need, or the, it's evident that there is a need, 
and you don't even recognize it, then you're, you're pretty selfish. You're selfish. And we'll see that in this text today. And let's get into this, this text and this message for today. Uh, as we look in this text in verse 19, it starts off saying, there was a certain rich man. And I want to just pause there for just a moment. Because here's we see this, this phrase, a certain. And Jesus used this, this, this terminology, this phrase, throughout this uh, Luke, uh, God, Luke's gospel. It's recorded here, when, especially when he's giving his, his parables. He'll start off a certain man or a certain person, a certain this. And here's something that you need to grasp from this and understand. That when you see this, this phrase, a certain, what this does, and that this, this gives the speaker some latitude when, within the parable without developing particular stereotypes against everyone within any particular group. It keeps them from making stereotypes. You know, uh, a certain uh, woman walking the street. It doesn't say that every woman that's walking the street is a prostitute or is it this or lives this kind of life. A certain Asian man was in his community. It doesn't mean that all Asians are act or behave that way or, or have the quality or the less less than qualities that you may be speaking of in your in your parable. Uh, it may say every black man, a certain black man was, and it doesn't mean that all black men are that way. And so when he says a certain, it gives him the, the speaker some latitude to, to not develop stereotypes for an entire group. But what it also does, it, it is used to grab the attention of the listener. When it starts off a certain man, a certain woman, then it grabs your attention. You want to hear what it is about this certain person. What is it particular about this certain person? So when we get into this text, uh, with the, and we're talking about self-examination and the pitfalls of a selfish life. Well, the first pitfall, pitfall number one, that we want to leave with you is that this rich man, he became nameless. Pitfall number one is that he became nameless. And when you're nameless, you no longer matter. Look in the text. It, it, it says, uh, there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. His name is not given. Uh, it, it, it doesn't matter about who he was. And then eventually you'll see in this text that he himself really doesn't matter. Who he is doesn't matter because there, there are some things going on that people with this kind of quality in their life, and this certain rich man, not all rich men, but this certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen. He had the best. He was dressed well. It says that the nameless rich man who lived a sumptuous life. He lived sumptuously. And this word sumptuously is lampros in the Greek. And it means to luxuriously, luxuriously. Uh, it means splendidly. He lived that way every day. He was dressed in the, the, the finest clothes. He, when he had on his Gucci shoes, he had on his Gucci, whole entire Gucci outfit. Uh, when, he, when he went out, he had the best of clothing. As a matter of fact, he was so dressed well that he may have even wanted to start his own clothing line. Uh, and so here this rich man who dressed in fine linen, he had the Egyptian cotton on, and, and, and maybe even he had uh, uh, some, some of the, the best designers uh, making his clothes for him. Uh, it says that he was dressed in purple and fine linen. And so being dressed in purple, that was, it was a very costly type of garment because of the dyeing process. And so those garments sold for a little more. So he, it, it get, lets us know that he had on the best and he could afford the best. It says he lived sumptuously every day. He did, there wasn't a day that went by that he wasn't dressed fine and, and ate well and had the best of things. He had the, the bling bling and all the other things to go along with his lifestyle. But notice that it, what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that he was a, a, a thief. It doesn't say that he robbed and stole. It just says that he was a rich man who lived sumptuously every day. So from this initial uh, look, as at this man, it doesn't seem that there's anything really wrong because there's nothing wrong with being wealthy. 
There's nothing wrong with having the best of clothing or the a fine car. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and so we have to be careful in this text that we don't just get to make stereotypes of everyone who's rich or everyone who dresses well or everyone who has a fine car or a fine home or eats well every day. That's not the point here. It's going to get into the details of this man in this parabolic uh, message that you'll see here. It says, the rich man fared uh, sumptuously every day. He lived in luxury every day. But the beggar, he had a name. His name was Lazarus. Verse 20 says, and there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. Lazarus had a name. And his name, the name Lazarus means God has helped. And so when you look at this rich man who is nameless, and then the name of this beggar, and it's, it's not, not a typical thing to give the name of a person in the parable. Most parables that you'll see, the person's name is not given. And so some believe that this may even be a real story about real people. But nevertheless, we see that Lazarus was given a name because what? He mattered. In this story, Lazarus matters more than the rich man. Well, why? Is, it, is there something about the poor that, that makes them um, better than the rich man? And so we have to be careful with this poor man's theology that we think that everybody's poor is living right and everybody rich isn't. Again, the, the, when he starts off as saying a certain rich man, it also says in verse 20, a certain beggar. So the, 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 it gives the speaker the latitude not to put every poor person in this poor person's uh, status. So pitfall number one is that he was nameless. And you don't want to live a nameless life where nobody remembers you anymore. And we'll see this in, in this text a little bit further down. He was nameless and he didn't matter. But Lazarus matters because his name is given. And when we see that it says a certain beggar, this word beggar here uh, in this text is tokos, and, and it, it can be compared with uh, pines. Pines means poor and needy. Here, tokos means uh, someone who is dependent on others, a poor person. They, they are poor, but they are dependent on other persons for the things that they need. So when they talk about this beggar, he was somebody who who was poor and he depended on somebody else to help him, to give him assistance in his daily moving about. It says that this, this, there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate and full of sores. And that takes us into pitfall number two. Pitfall number two is that this rich man, he lacked compassion. The pitfalls of a selfish life is that you end up being nameless, number one. And then number two, that he has <clears throat> or that you have no compassion. You have no feelings for others. Look at the text in verse 20 again. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, the rich man's gate, and full of sores. Lazarus was laid at his gate. Again, he needed the assistance. Someone had to place him there. Why was he placed here? Because this man was rich, and he knew he had, he, he had a plenty. And so he was laid at his gate so that he could possibly have some compassion on him, and that this rich man would maybe give something to him, just a little something that he could make his day. Do you have compassion for those people that you come across daily, that are right in front of you, that are laid right at your doorstep, that God places right in front of you? Do you have any compassion or do those people just not matter because you are so selfish and everything is about you? Everything is focused right on you and you having all the things that you need. The, the, Lazarus was not only just laid at his gate, but look at his state. It says he was full of sores. That means not only was he needy for uh, his uh, food and, and 
some substance to have to either eat and to make it through the day, but he also needed medical attention. Not just because he was laid there, meaning that he was probably paralyzed, couldn't move, he couldn't walk there on his own, but he was also full of sores. And it doesn't say anything in the text that the rich man ran him away. And so you might say, well, he was compassionate enough to allow him to stay there. But guess what? When he walked out of his gate, he walked right over that man or walked right past him on a daily basis and didn't have any compassion for him at all. Look what else it says. It says he desired the crumbs from his table. In, in verse 21, it says, and, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. He wanted just the crumbs. You know what crumbs are. We know that. It's the stuff that when you're eating and, and it's the leftover stuff. And it could be the things that as you're eating that falls off and just hits the table or and, and there's crumbs on the table. And so what do we do with crumbs? Well, in those days, they would just sweep them off the table, brush it off the table onto the floor. And then once you there on the floor, you sweep it up and then you dump it. And so he's asking for the worst of the food that he has, that that food that has been laid on the, laying on the floor, swept up and tossed into the trash. He said, just give me the crumbs. Give, give me that. I'll take that off that fell from your table. He was desiring to be fed. It doesn't say that he was fed with the crumbs from the rich man's table. But then again, it doesn't say that he, he didn't ever get to that. So the thing that we notice in this text, that rich man being a selfish people end up where nobody really remembers their name in the long run. The other pitfall is that you have no compassion for other people. And that'll say a lot about the compassion that others will have for you. We you know what happened to the prodigal son. He had all of his and he ran off and had a uh, lived a uh, riotous life. He lived it up. And then when all his money was gone, nobody cared about him. They only had compassion or they liked him uh, because he had some money. And then when it was all gone, nobody cared anything about him. That was pitfall number two. The rich man had no compassion and he just didn't even care about Lazarus. And notice what else happens. Not only did the man not have compassion on him, but his compassion was less than that of the dogs. Look at the end of verse 21. It says, moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The dogs had more compassion for Lazarus than the rich man did. The rich man could have at least bound up his wounds and had somebody just take care of him. You're going to lay here at my gate. Uh, give him a little something to eat and, and bind up his wounds. And we know that story uh, of in scripture, in scripture that deals with um, the, the man who was found on the side of the road and, and then the, the Samaritan came along and, and helped him, bound up his wounds and, and, and took care of him and, and paid for everything because the, the Samaritan had compassion. But all the Jewish people that walked past him didn't. And so how is it that you can attend church on a daily basis and still see the needs of somebody in your community right in front of you and not have compassion for their needs. We have such a, a whole large homeless community in this city and in various cities across this nation, and we have no compassion on them. There was a story of a man in uh, Madeira, I think it's Madeira, uh, up in Oregon somewhere, that in, back in December, December 20th, uh, they had, in April they passed this law that said that you can't have tents or any kind of bedding uh, in, within the city proper, and the, or you'll be fined up to $500 and jailed. So this young man who was in his 20s or, uh, or so uh, couldn't sleep in his tent, and it was on December 20th, he froze to death. He died because he didn't have, he couldn't sleep in a sleeping bag, he couldn't sleep in a tent, he had to just lay on the ground, and he froze to death. And so they tried to pass uh, um, an ordinance to where that they would put that ordinance of no tents and whatever uh, on hold. But the officials decided, no, 
we're to keep this ordinance and move on. No compassion for those who are homeless. No compassion for those who have the biggest need. That just get, allowing them to have a tent to sleep in, whether it's in the city or not, that they can be protected from the cold. And you are a brother that they lay out there and die or go to jail. You know, if they're homeless, they don't have $500 to pay. No compassion. And so we see in this text uh, what has happened to us as God's ch children. What, what, what is really happening to us in this nation, in this world, that as God's people, that we can walk past people and not have compassion on them, that, that we can walk right over someone with a real need and, and just watch them die, watch them pass away and not have compassion on them to try to help their needs. That's because we are living a very, very selfish life. And we have to examine ourselves. This would right here would be a good moment to examine ourselves when we when our compassion for our brother man, our, our fellow sister, is so low that we would rather see them die in need than to give them a helping hand. And so just touch yourself right now. And to, I need to examine myself. Am I really that selfish that I would allow someone right before me to die when I could have given them a little bit of help? I may not have been able to take care of all their needs, but I can give them the help that God has given to me. We have the things that God has given to us, and we're running over. We, we throw away more food than, than some people have in a lifetime. And we have no compassion on other people. Luke 6, 38 tells us, it says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye met, of the same measure that you gave out, with all it shall be measured to you again. If you just give to some other people with all that you have, give to someone else in need. It will be given back to you in good measure. And look what it says in the text. It's, I love this text here. It says, given it shall be given unto you, good measure, a, a, a large amount, something that it doesn't have to be excessive, but, but, but look what it says in the text. Good measure, pressed down. When you press it down, that means you make more room for more to be given to you. Press down, shaken together. You know, when you shake things together, you take up all those air spaces, uh, those, those little air pockets. It, it removes those. When it's shaken together, that means it drops down even more and it makes more room for more to be given. Press down, shaken together, and guess what? Running over. That you will now even have even more that your container can usually handle and given to you that and we get the running over uh, because God says all that excess is what you can use. I want to make sure that you have enough. So I'm going to make sure that the container that you have is pressed down, shaken together, so you can even have more than you had before. But guess what? I'm going to give you so much more that you'll have enough running over to give to those in need. You need to take this moment and examine yourself. What is it that you refuse to give to help somebody else? It may not necessarily be money, but it could be all those clothes that you have in your attic that you want to have a garage sale and make some more money off of. Why don't you just give it to somebody in need? What about all of the, that excess that you have? You have five cars in your driveway and it's just you and your wife. Maybe there's somebody out there who, who walks to work every day, who catches the bus. Maybe you can give them a car and fix it up, make sure it's running well, and give it to them. I know people that'll do that uh, and that would give of the excess that they have to others. Why don't we do that when we have so much given to us? It's because we lack compassion and we become a selfish people. And when it's in God's house, that's when that examination comes about. It says, examine yourself, test yourself, prove yourself that you are Jesus Christ, that you belong to Christ, except that you be reprobate. If you're reprobate and you do have no compassion for anyone, you're disqualified, then, you, then, then yes, you will live a selfish type of life. 
And then as we prepare to close, pitfall number three. Pitfall number three is the worst of all because pitfall number three is the loss of eternal comfort. The loss of eternal comfort. You suffer more in the end. You will suffer more in the end when you're selfish, when you're so self-centered that you have no compassion for anyone else and you just become another nameless person who had a whole lot that could have done some things for someone else and chose not to. No one's going to remember you in the end. And your eternal comfort by, through salvation through Jesus Christ will be lost forever. It's right here in this text. Let's look at verse 21. And it says, In desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And notice what it says here in verse 22. And it came to pass. You know, we talk about uh, on people's tombstones, you see their date of birth, and then you see the, the date of death. But in the middle, there's that dash. And so that dash is all that we have to do in life to, to live before God in a righteous way. And even when we stumble and fall, God forgives us. So that dash encompasses all of the forgiveness that we receive. But then you could have a short dash or a long dash, but that dash comes to an end. And it comes to pass that at the end of that dash, dash is your date of departure from this world. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. I want you to notice something in this text. That we started off talking about first the rich man. And we talked about him living sumptuous. Then we talked about the beggar. Then we talked about the rich man and, the, and then the beggar. But notice here, it reverses. And it says that the beggar died. But look at what happens with the beggar. He was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And it came to pass. All things have to come to an end. And then the judgment. Lazarus was in paradise, in Abraham's bosom. And then it says, the rich man also died and was buried. Isn't that something? As rich as he was. He may have had a marvelous and, and extravagant funeral procession. But all the text says is that he died and was buried. End of story. The nameless man, the man who, had, uh, who didn't really matter in life because he had no compassion for other people. He only thought of himself. He, he just lived a sumptuous life and had the finest of clothing, but he didn't care about anybody else in his own selfish ways. And so when he died, he just died, and that's it. End of story. But there's more to this than you will see. And it says in verse 22, the rich man also died and was buried. And look at verse 23. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. That's the end of his story. He is now living in hell. Lazarus was in paradise. The rich man, he died and was buried. And what a sad ending to his life. The rich man was in hell and in torment. He wasn't having a sumptuous life. He wasn't dressed in the finest of clothing because in hell, it's going to be constant burning and torment. And this rich man is now living in torment for eternity. And that's what happens when we live such a selfish life. The rich man wanted Lazarus to come to him and comfort him. He wanted compassion from Lazarus. Look what he says. He talks to Abraham and begs Abraham. He doesn't ask Abraham to come to him, but he wants Lazarus, the man who laid before his gate, the man who he knew him by his name. He lived right there at his gate, or he was laid there daily at his gate, and he knew his name. He knew who he was. He knew that he was a beggar, that he had needs, that he was covered in sores. 
and had no compassion on him during the times of that dash of his life. But he, when his dash came to an end, when it came to pass that he died and was just buried, now he's there in torment and he looks up and sees the, the writ, the, excuse me, Lazarus lying in the bosom of Abraham in paradise, having been comforted by Abraham, that he calls to Abraham to command Lazarus to come and serve him in his needs. Isn't that the way selfish people are? That they don't even realize what they could have done and don't even have any sense of remorse for the way they lived, the way they treated somebody. It says, in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and sees Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And so we're not going to spend much time in the rest of these verses because we can get into uh, the whole thing about being able to see him, and that, that's another discussion. But there are some pointers in here that, that we need to, to recognize, and that is, again, that he wanted Lazarus to dip his finger in the water just to get just a little bit and to give him to give him some comfort. Why now does he want some comfort? But look what the scripture says about it all. And that's what we will do. And we come to this, this end of our life. And now when it's too late to give our life to the Lord, we want compassion from somebody. We want compassion. We'll look to heaven and call for compassion. And we go on down to the end of this message. And, and when he calls out and wants somebody to go and to his family to, to warn them, not only does he want Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and give him some comfort, uh, but now he also wants uh, Lazarus to be sent back to his family to tell them uh, to warn his five brothers to live right, have some compassion. So this thing runs in the family. They all were... were selfish type people, whether they lived as sumptuous as this rich man or not, we don't know. But apparently they were living a foul life because he wants Lazarus to go back to warn them so that they don't end up in torment with him. And then we get to verse 31. And he said unto him, Abraham, speaking to the rich man, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And that's a warning to us all, that we need to hear the word of God from the man of God, from the woman of God, whoever's delivering God's message to us. We need to hear that word. Not only do we need to hear it, but we need to pick it up and read it for ourselves. We need to make it uh, of something that we read in the morning, when we meditate it on, on it day throughout the day, and when we go to bed meditating on God's word, making it a, a part of our life, that it's, it's not only in our hearts, but it's all throughout our life. If we move through our house, we come in our doors, we're thinking of the word of God. When we go out our doors, we're thinking on the word of God. He says that if they would not listen to Moses and the prophets, if they're not heeding the warning that's already been given to them, they won't even heed the warning from someone who came from the dead. And they're speaking particularly of Lazarus in this text, but it goes on further, and that further implication as Jesus is speaking to the people and giving this parable. We have to recognize that this is a parable that Jesus has given to the, the followers that are coming behind him, and also speaking to the scribes and Pharisees who's always trying to trick him up and saying that if you don't even listen, to Moses and the prophets. You church people, you that, that go to church every day and you're not listening to the word of God. You're not heeding the word of God. You're not living according to the word of God. You may be in there and you may know some things. You may be able to quote, quote scripture, but you haven't given yourself any self-examination. You don't have the right perspective on life that you are making up all these rules for everybody else. And, and regulations that they have to follow to in order for you to give them the, the right uh, stamp of approval. But God says you need to just love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. The, if one rose from the dead, and Jesus is saying that you don't even listen to Moses and the prophets, but now even if someone rose from the dead, which I will do, I will be crucified and, and by you, 
because of at your hands. But it's not because of you. It's because I have to be sacrificed for the sins of the world. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And so even when I'm sacrificed and, and I'm laid in my grave and in my tomb, that one day on that third day has been prophesied, I will rise up and you won't even believe that I rose from the dead to redeem you back. And there are people today that don't believe that Jesus, a dead Jesus, can rise as their Savior to redeem them back. But I hope you're not so selfish and so self-centered to think that you are the God in your life, that you are the one that make a difference. Don't be so self-centered and without compassion and ended up being a nameless person that nobody will remember in the end. Because in the end, this too shall pass. And when it comes to pass, it's all over, it's too late. You can't give your life to the Lord. You can't be redeemed and you will not be comforted, but you will be living in torment. So give your life today. That's all that we have for you this, this morning. We want you to give your life to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Accept him as your Lord and Savior. Listen to the word of God. Study it. Meditate on it. And accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. You know that you didn't get yourself to the point all by yourself. There's been things God has been doing in your life that you have not given him the glory for. Well, right now, you have that opportunity to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. Have mercy on me is the cry that we've all made. And God will listen to us when we get our heart right. And we, and we don't get it right in and of ourselves. We get it right when we accept Jesus Christ and we recognize that he is God's only begotten son. And so, at this time, we open the doors of the church that if you are willing uh, and want to give your life to the Lord, you may do so at this time. Uh, you can put your name in the chat and let us know that I accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. I want to live a life that's not so self-centered, but I focus on Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. You can do that right now. Put your name in the chat, or if you want, don't want to put your name in the chat, you, you want it personal, you can uh, email me at pastornewbeginningshow at gmail.com. Pastornewbeginningshow at gmail.com. And I will get in touch with you, and we'll have a conversation. If you're not in this, this area in Nashville, we'll make sure that you find a place that you can get baptized. And if you still want to be a part of this ministry, uh, whether you're in Nashville or not, we will take you in as a member of this church. Uh, we could use you. Uh, we'd love to have you here ministering to God's people with us. And so and if you, another way that you can get in touch with me is at 615-473-5464. 615-473-5464. Number would be posted at this message. And you can leave me a message. I'll get in touch with you and we will talk. We'll make sure that you are in this Christian fellowship. If you're someone out there who uh, has already given your life to the Lord and you want to be redeemed, you want to, to rededicate your life, we'll do that as well. Whatever it takes to get you into the kingdom is the main goal that we have here in this ministry. So if you would love to give to this ministry, uh, you can give through Giblify.com uh, at Giblify, and you can just click on Donate uh, or to Give, and you can search for our location, New Beginnings HOW. Uh, we're located at our New Beginnings House of Worship, and you'll find our location as it's printed here on the screen, 3919 Kings Lane, Nashville, Tennessee. Or if you're like me, sometimes you don't want to... Uh, do too much giving online, you can just mail it to us at New Beginnings House of Worship, 3919 Kings Lane, Nashville, Tennessee, 37218. The address is here on your screen. Uh, and so we thank you for being here with us. Uh, we prepare ourselves and our hearts and minds uh, for what is called Valentine's Day, a day of love. We want to encourage you, and we'll post this again later, uh, to use the hashtag send love, sending love. Sending Love, capital S, capital L, hashtag Sending Love, and just send a message to someone who doesn't have, uh, may, may not be uh, 
romantically involved with someone, uh, may not have family here in town, uh, but send them some love as well. Because so many times we think about ourselves and our loved ones and we talk about it around people and, and they may be in a, a moment of sadness. Maybe they lost their loved one or maybe they've tried love and it just didn't work and everybody's talking about it. Let's send them some love. So just use the hashtag sending love and send it that message to someone and let's see if this become a trending topic. God bless you and God keep you. Uh, again, this is Black History Month. We want you to continue to, to learn more about the things and the contribution of African Americans in this, this nation. We hope that this message has helped you. If so, share it with your family and friends. Until next time, have a blessed and wonderful day. Whew, I got started.